Hello, everybody. Do we have the final people in here that came from that last tour? Yes, everybody from that last bus? Great, super. All those credentials, didn't that sound impressive? I promise you. Wow. None of that stuff matters. All that, what, all that matters is if you can have a crowd and keep their attention, right? And so with that, I do not require your undivided attention. So please keep your cell phones on. You probably want to turn off the ringer, just because if the ringer goes off, everyone's going to look at you and stare and snicker. But after that, if you hear something interesting and want to share it, that's my Twitter handle, at Deepanetti. If you have something more important to do, if you have to check in with work, if you have to uh, text your kids, by all means do that. Because if I can hold your attention, that's not your fault, that's my problem. Okay? So, we're going to go ahead and get started. I always like to start with a quote. This is a quote from Mark Twain. Um, probably apocryphal, but we'll stick with it. And it says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure. That just ain't so. And most of the problem that we have in innovation comes from that statement. Something you absolutely know to be true. And when you actually test it against reality, it turns out to be wrong. Right? So, where does innovation start? Well, of course, it starts with the idea, the brilliant idea that's going to change the world, that's going to make you rich and famous and put you on the cover of Time magazine. Everybody at this table has one, and you're going to actually make it a reality. All you need to do is get a little bit of funding. So you go to your finance team, or you go to your VCs, or you go to your angels, and you say, I've got this idea, all I need is a little bit of money to make it happen. And they say, okay, great. So what's the ROI? Return on investment. How much money are you going to make me if I give you money? Now, the entrepreneur says, okay. They start to sweat a little, but they're like, no, okay, I get it. I, I can figure out an ROI. Uh, let me just open up my spreadsheet program and, oh, look here, ROI calculation, MPP spreadsheet. All I have to do is just plug in the numbers, right? So I start to plug in the numbers and I produce this nice guy. Everybody here has a financial statement, I'm assuming at some point, right? Tell people how much money they're going to make in the future, right? And then you say, okay, very simple. This is how much money I need now. This is how much money I'm going to make in the future. And uh, the money I'm going to make in the future, even discounted for that, is going to make you a lot of money right now. We're all going to be rich, right? So, what's the problem? Well, the problem is after you're done filling in all of these numbers, there's only one column on this spreadsheet that you can actually rely on. Does anyone know which one it is? Yes. It's the place where you say, give me this money, and then you go and spend that money. That is guaranteed to happen. Whatever you raise, you will spend. All this other stuff, from this point moving forward, after you get the check, is complete bullcrap. It is. It's complete. Yes, you know, right? Yes, you know. You've been through it, of course, right? Because I can't even tell you what the weather is going to be like in a week. How am I supposed to give you 10-year unit revenue projections and profit margins for products that don't exist in markets that don't exist? That is the most ludicrous thing in the world. And yet this is how we fund our innovation. Right? Something is very wrong with this problem. Right? So what's the answer? Right? Now, the typical answer for people that have been here before is that they take this spreadsheet and they try to bolster it up with all of these research reports and analysts and forecasts and total market analysis, right? So they're like, no, I really get this. I really understand this market. Right? I'm going to put together all of these numbers and I'm going to figure out exactly what, exactly what the right answer is, supporting all of that information, right? Does that actually really happen, though? Right? Because what happens if those numbers come back and the number is too low? Well, that's not going to work for your funding. What if you actually run the analysis and the number is too high? Well, then it's really not believable and no one's going to think that I'm credible. So this exercise that we fool ourselves into thinking we've produced this unbelievably sophisticated analysis actually is an exercise in tweaking your spreadsheet to the point where you get that final MPV number to be big enough to get people excited, but not so big that they think you're insane, right? Has anybody tweaked a, a spreadsheet like that? 
Does anyone have a friend in another company or another startup that has tweaked their spreadsheets in the past to get the number they want? Yeah. Look, we all know that this happens. And the reason it happens is because if you can't produce a ROI analysis in advance, you get no money. You can't go to finance and say, no, just write me a check. I'm not going to tell you how much you're going to make. No ROI? That's not a solution. Because this is what you look like to them. And that's all the money burning up. Right? Fundamentally, the accounting is the problem. The accounting is the problem. And let me just say right now from the bottom of my heart that I am so pleased that you came here to spend two hours with me talking about accounting. Yeah! All right. The accounting is the problem. We don't need traditional accounting. What we actually need is innovation accounting. Innovation accounting. Accounting for the innovative work that we're doing, OK? Now, not inventive accounting. That gets you in prison. No inventive accounting. Innovation accounting, very different thing. So innovation accounting, what is it? What is it? We're talking about it. We're going to talk about it. What is it? Well, I like this definition from Eric Reese, of course, popularized the lean startup. Innovation accounting is a way of evaluating progress when all of the typical metrics that we would use are effectively zero, right? No revenue, no users, no growth, just a prayer. How do we measure progress? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, in order to get a little bit of background on this, we have to talk about the different things that you try to accomplish at different stages of the company. So we're going to break this down into three particular groups. These are three accounting horizons. These are three different ways that you're actually going to want to measure your progress. Now, almost everybody in this room is going to start in one bucket. And if you're lucky, you'll get it to the next one. And if you're really lucky, you'll get to the third one. But we're going to talk about those right now. For those of you who are interested in strategy, this is based on something called the McKinsey Three Horizons Framework. We're simply going to adapt it for the purposes of understanding how these things differ from one another. So what do we start with? Well, we start with the standard product life cycle. This should look familiar to everybody, right? We have this brand new idea. We start it. We go through this period of development. After we develop it, we launch it. A lot of what the, the curves here represent is the green represents your overarching growth and then uh, your revenue growth. And then the yellow one represents the profit, the cost curve is left unstated, right? But you can obviously tell growth less your cost is your profit. Your profit is negative at the beginning. You're losing money because you're developing your product. Then you have your launch. Boom, everything is up into the right hockey stick growth. You reach maturity. You make money for as long as you possibly can. Hopefully this graph is not to scale. Uh, and then you have a period of decline until the product eventually is end of life. Well, what the three horizons does, three accounting horizons, is it breaks us down into its three distinct phases. The goal. And what McKinsey calls horizon one, because they're a little bit backwards on this, but the goal, horizon one, is profit. Here's where we want to wind up. Everybody with me? Nod your head. Yes, lots of money, lots of profit. Good. Now, if you're doing an NGO or nonprofit, yes, your, your goals are different. But for most, profit is the goal. But before we can profit, we have to grow. And when I say grow here, I mean nonlinear growth, right? I'm not talking about incremental, making it just a little bit better, 1% more revenue share. I'm talking about the type of year after year growth that we would associate with big startups like Airbnb and all the successes that you guys are going to make. That's nonlinear growth, right? But before you can grow, you have to exist. And that's the point of the innovation phase, where you're spending money to create something that eventually will grow and that eventually will turn into profit. Why does this matter? Because at each distinct phase, you have distinct things that you're trying to accomplish and distinct metrics that you're trying to tie towards. For instance, in the profit phase, you're looking for profitability, return on invested capital, internal rates of return, fundamental measures of profitability. Make my money, keep making my money, make your numbers at the quarter, if you've worked in a large corporation at all, this is the mantra all the time. Make your numbers, make your numbers. Don't do anything to make your innovation, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear it. Just make my numbers, just make my numbers. I'm making profit every quarter. Don't screw that up. OK? So what happens before that? Well, you need to grow. Growth focuses on a different set of goals and objectives. This is growth, revenue, market share, lift, partnerships, penetration. We want to expand into these markets as quickly and as aggressively as we possibly can. And we don't care as much about profit. 
This is why an Uber or a Lyft or an Airbnb can lose billions of dollars and yet still have tons of money shoveling behind them to continue to increase their valuation. Why? Because they're growing like crazy. And the assumption is, well, you're growing like crazy. Eventually, you're going to reach this profit phase and return a lot of profit. Okay? But right now, I don't care about the profitability. This defines Amazon, by the way, and has defined Amazon for almost all of its existence. Willing to sacrifice profitability in order to keep growth going. Okay? So, the great thing about this is that you have the yellow line that's above and it's profitable, so you can measure the profit, right? And here, on the growth phase, you see the growth. It's up and to the right. You can measure it. You can track it, right? All these metrics are perfectly fine, perfectly safe, and commensurate with consistent traditional accounting methods, right? So now let's go to the innovation phase. What can we measure? Well, this is flat. There's no revenue. There's no users. There's no growth. So what's left? Costs, right? So we measure costs. Are you on time? Are you on budget? Right? And these are the traditional metrics that we fall back to when we're using traditional approaches to measure our progress because you manage what you measure. So when you're an innovator, we measure costs. We manage costs. What do we do with costs? Right. We manage them down. We manage them out. We shrink them. We make them small and tiny and impossible. So you didn't meet your targets, you're out. This is what we're trying to avoid. This is what makes traditional accounting bad. This is what needs to be replaced with innovation accounting. Okay? Because if you are measuring your effectiveness of your innovation programs by the cost effectiveness or how on time or on budget you are doing, if it doesn't lead anywhere, then it doesn't matter how fast you get there or how cheaply you get there. So innovation accounting is what we want to replace that. Okay? So. What's the goal? What's the goal, right? Eventually, profitability. So, let's look at that same product life cycle in a different context, through a different lens. Okay? So, what do we have here? You can imagine the same product life cycle, hypergrowth, and then eventually profit, right? The interesting thing about this is that all these things have assumptions built into them, right? Which are largely true. If you're in a business that is profitable and profiting, and right now I'm talking about Coca-Cola and you know, all the things that we consider normal established companies, right? They're focused on their profitability. We know they can be profitable, and if they're not profitable, they don't stay in business very long, right? And then we can look at your Airbnbs and your Amazons and your Lyfts and your Ubers, and you say they are growing, they are continuing to grow, and we can measure and we can track that. We know that it's possible because it's happening right now. And of course, when we're in the innovation phase, we know we have costs, we know we're spending money. That's why that first column in your spreadsheet is the only one that you can be guaranteed to be accurate, right? Because the only thing that you know at this time, because you don't have anything else. So, if your goal is eventually to get up here, right? If that's your goal, eventually is to come up here, well then things have to underline both of these things that you're heading towards. There are assumptions that are underlying the eventual target places that you need to go. So what are those assumptions? Well, when you're profiting, there's no more assumptions that need to make. You're profiting, you're done, that's it. Continue to profit until the end of time, hopefully. But when you're in the growth phase, yes, you know you can grow and you need to continue to grow, but the assumption is you are also eventually going to profit, right? So if you ever looked at all these high-flying companies that were never able to turn a profit, even though they were able to grow like mad, those are the ones that were able to establish and know and establish a good growth engine, but were never able to figure out what their profit engine was. Turntable FM, yo, I can go on. Okay? Then in the innovation phase, what do you know? You know you have costs, and the assumption is that whatever you are building is going to grow. Otherwise, why would you build it? Right? This is just being very specific about the targets that we want to maintain. Because we don't plan on staying in any of these ter first two horizons. We want to get to the goal. We want to eventually get to the final location, right? And that means that there are assumptions that underlie what we're trying to achieve at that particular moment. Let's get rid of costs because we know that they're there and they're unavoidable, but they're not important for this analysis. What's left? What can we see? We're trying to take our assumptions and turn them into knowledge. We're trying to take our assumptions and turn them into knowledge, right? That is the whole point of the exercise. That's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to go from a position 
of low certainty through time, through the efforts that we're doing, and rise up to a position of high certainty on both of these. And when we achieve high certainty on our growth engine, and then subsequently on our profit engine, we know we have a successful business. All right. Turning assumptions into knowledge. That's the goal. We have another word for that. It's called learning. Right? And my understanding is everybody here is familiar with the Lean Startup Method. That is the fundamental point of the Lean Start Method to have a very effective way to turn your assumptions and produce knowledge at the most cost-effective manner. It doesn't require you to spend billions of dollars in half your life chasing something that will never get there. Okay? Now, for those of you who are the entrepreneurs in this early phase, and I'm assuming most of you are, I want you to notice something about this. This is my position. Uh, uh, I believe in it strongly. You may feel differently. Others do feel differently. But my position is that you have to establish certainty around your growth engine before you establish it around your profit engine. The fact that these are coming at different points in time is not accidental, right? If you are profiting without growth, great. Successful business, probably not venture fundable, right? Dry cleaning, restaurants, wonderful businesses. You put your kids through college, have a nice house, have a nice life, but you're not necessarily going to have Kleiner Perkins come and hand you a check, okay? Unless you can demonstrate some very high growth. That has to come first. Okay? So that's our first priority, to turn our assumption into knowledge. So, again, let's look at this in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. When you are an established business, when you are a large functioning company that relies on, on, on traditional approaches, you have high certainty of both profit and growth because they've both been established. You're in a pure execution mode. Pure execution mode. Okay? We know what we need to do. Now let's go out and do it, and you can measure me by how successful I was at accomplishing that goal. Okay? Now, what about in this next phase? Well, here you had a mix of execution, executing what we know, and exploration, testing our assumptions against what's real in the world. It requires a very different set of skills. Okay? So, for those who are in this particular phase, and this would include companies that are now high flying startups that are growing but have yet to establish their profit engine. That's what they need to do. They need to ex execute and continue to maintain their high growth levels while at the same time figuring out how they're going to make money. Now, the very interesting thing about here is this is the only place that you have a mix. And here is a place where you have a race. You have a race. You have to continue to grow, and you're racing against yourself. You have to continue to grow and figure out a profit model before your growth stalls. If your growth stalls before you figure out a profit model, you're going to be in trouble. Right? Anyone know a company that went through this just a couple of years ago? Twitter? Growth started to stall. Oh, we got to get growth up. Let's hire you know, Jack Dorsey back. Well, growth is still not working. I need to raise some more money. No one wants to give you any more money because your growth is stalling. Right? The investors say, hey, remember all that profit? Remember all that profit you told me you were going to pay me? <laughs> I want that now. Right? He says, well, yeah, OK, I'll get it for you. And what do they have to do? kill Vine, cut a whole bunch of other projects, and uh, slash 15% of their workforce and another 10% of their workforce and just recently entered profitability. Right? Another company going through this right now at this particular point in time is Snap. Right? Or any other company that's establishing high growth, but the growth is starting to stall and they haven't figured out how they're going to make money yet. Right? Very dangerous zone. Okay? And then finally, we have the last one, which is where most of us are probably at. But that is the pure exploration phase, where we're doing nothing but turning our assumptions into knowledge. Right? And it requires a particular set of skills, a particular set of benchmarks. We're going to, again, go into most, I mean, not only all day today, but throughout the remainder of this presentation. OK? So just to recap, when you're above the line of certainty, you want to do traditional approach. Waterfall, totally fine. Linear forecasting, absolutely. Get analyst reports and product, absolutely, no question about it. Go ahead and knock yourself out. But when you're below the line of certainty and you cannot predict the future with any degree of confidence, then you have to take a different approach. Okay? And the level of certainty dictates the strategy that you take. Okay? It dictates the strategy that you take. Because when you have functions of execution where certainty is very, very high, well, then you need to be smarter than your competition. Okay? You need to be smarter than your competition. 
That's fundamentally, strategically how you're going to get ahead. I want to make smarter planning decisions, smarter hiring decisions, smarter tactical decisions, smarter pricing decisions. I want all those things to be smart. I want to know the answer in advance before I move forward. Whereas when you're in the exploration phase, you have to be faster than your competition. Right? That means trial and error, lots of iterations, lots of experiments, taking the information that you get from the experiments, learning from it, turning your assumptions, and taking them into knowledge. Right? Now, I want to dwell on this slide for just a little bit. Uh, my understanding is everyone has a background in this, but I really want to hammer this point home. For most people, for most people that are in a professional context, they got to where they are not because they were faster, right? Not because they employed trial and error. Putting aside the entrepreneurs, right? If you go and try trial and error in most of your large companies in corporate America, you try trial and error when you're in the profit phase, you're like, sure, absolutely, trial and error. Just don't screw up, <laughs> right? Trial and error without the error, right? And, and I mean, they'll say that with a straight face, right? The people that run the majority of the companies got to where they were by following a very simple rule. Don't take the test until you know the answer in advance. How did they get to the top? How did they get to the C-suite? Well, they had a rec track record of overperforming. They, they were able to take all of their, uh, their financials and their forecasts, and they knocked it out of the park. Well, how did they get that job? Well, they did the same thing in their last company. Well, how did they get their first job? Well, they went into the interview, and they just answered all the questions right, and they just really, really nailed the interview. Well, how did they get that interview? Well, they went to college, and they just scored so well on their grades. They just fantastic, top of their class, got all these awards. Oh, God, how did they even get into the college? Well, man, they took that SAT, and they just rocked it. They just got nearly perfect score on the SAT. Well, how did they even you know, get their grades? In? Well, all the way back through high school, they were always prepared for their tests. Studied hard, buck up. They got to where they were by one simple rule. Don't take the test until you know the answer in advance, which is impossible when you are facing uncertainty. If you are looking for high growth opportunities, for the types of things that go up and to the right, for the types of things that produce hockey stick growth, by definition, the future is going to be uncertain. Because if everybody knew it, everybody had already been knowing it. That is your gift as an entrepreneur. You can see a future that nobody else can see. And if you make it reality, then you're going to reap the rewards. Okay? But going through the standard way of I need to make sure that I prove that before I go and, 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 uh, and, and be successful at it is a little bit backwards, okay? All right, great. So why is that important? Why is any of this important at the end of the day? Well, it's because this product life cycle is a one-way street. It is a one-way street. Once you pass those transition points, you cannot go back to a prior state, right? Look, running companies, doing startups, ideas, this is just like, like it comes, the word life cycle comes from life. It's just like us, right? We start off as this formulated mass, as a baby. We're not able to communicate at all between screaming. We keep you up at all hours of the night. For years, we cost all kinds of money and produce nothing but crap. Like, that is a startup, right? And then at some point, you start to raise, you, you start to shovel in a lot more money into them. They start growing like mad. They eat absolutely everything in the house, cost so much for college. You hope that they actually produce something out of that, grow and succeed in the world, and hopefully at some point, eventually, they can make a positive contribution to society, right? That's what a parent thinks. That's what a parent hopes. But just like you can't go from adolescence back to being a baby, Right? Or from being an adult back to being an adolescent, thank God. So your product can't go backwards. It's a one-way street. It's a one-way street. And so that's why this part is so important. I'm not going to dwell on it because it's a future problem and you have a lot of time to be able to figure out the answer. But before you transition, you have to have, before your growth stalls, right? you have to be able to execute on your profit engine. And once you start profiting, you can't go back to losing money hand over fist. 
Your employees won't allow it. Your shareholders won't allow it. The market won't allow it. Nobody will allow it. Okay? You just die if you can't maintain your profitability. Right? This is the one that's more important for you. You could only transition after your growth is known. If you have an assumption about your growth and that assumption turns out to be wrong, what happens? You flame out. You're done. Thank you for trying. Lean Startup is designed to help give you that answer in advance so that you do it more than just once to get more than one shot because there is no going back. Okay? All right. How do we tie some of these sort of like accounting concepts back into a practical accounting reality to everybody in this room? Well, here's the key thing to understand. Your funding sets your strategy. Your funding sets your strategy. If you raise a significant amount of money from the get-go, from the outset, you are required to produce growth from that. You don't have the option to just piddle around, right? You actually have to produce something with it because you've been given a tremendous amount of money and the investors want it back. So they're not just going to give you $50 million to go just kind of figure it out, right? So you have to make sure that you understand that when you accept a certain amount of money, you have dictated yourself the strategy that you're going to employ, right? Because at this stage, the innovation phase, it's acceptable to learn. It's acceptable because it's your goal. You don't know anything. You know nothing yet, right? So learning is acceptable. Yes, that's what we're trying to achieve. But once you start to get in the growth phase, it is no longer acceptable to learn on growth. You've got to keep delivering growth. You cannot go back. If you stop delivering growth, you run out of money. You run out of money, and nobody's willing to give you any more money. And then you're done, right? So your funding sets your strategy. This is probably going to be one of the most important things that you'll, you'll hopefully embrace. Y'all set? Oh, thank you. Uh, you'll embrace, but when you have an idea, the very first thing that you want to do is you want to go and you want to make it as big as possible, as fast as possible, and, and bring it out to everybody. I know it. I've been there. I get it. You've got the vision. You know the way the future is going to be, and you want to get there as quickly as possible. But you have to keep in mind that there is a possibility, however unlikely, that your assumptions might be wrong. Okay? And if that's true, then you don't want to raise a lot of money. Because as soon as you raise that amount of money, you're set. You're done. You have to deliver. You have to deliver. So you can forestall that by not taking a huge amount of money from the outset. And that's why this style of funding is so dangerous, right? Because this style of funding basically says, look, I'm going to promise all of the moon in advance. And so your investors give you that money on the basis of the promises that you make. So to them, this innovation and this growth, well, they're one and the same. You cannot separate them. You promised me the moon. Where is my moon? You don't have my moon, you're done, right? So that's why traditional accounting regimens fail under conditions of uncertainty. They require definitionally a large upfront investment. Because if you don't add, raise a lot of money, you can't generate a large MPV. You don't have a large enough MPV. Somebody else that has a bigger MPV gets the money. Because at the end of the day, what are we saying when we're coming into finance? We're saying, OK, I've got this great idea. The next person is saying, I've got this great idea. I've got the best Gartner reports behind it. I've got all these experts. We're going to make $100 million in five years, absolutely guaranteed. Where's my check? And you go up and say, yeah, I, I have no idea. But don't worry, I'm going to fail a lot as I find out. Can I have my money now? Right? One of these gets funding, and the other one gets kicked out of the office. Right? OK. Secondly, it's static and inflexible. Static and inflexible. Once you have made your assessments about the future, you have to deliver on it. And it doesn't matter if the circumstances have changed. And it doesn't matter <laughs> if, if what you learned along the way tells you that that approach is not going to work and you need to do something like pivot. 
You have produced the analysis that says this is the amount of money that you're going to make. I gave you the money based upon that as analysis. You can't change it. And finally, it encourages obfuscation as a result of that exact thing. Because you don't want to tell them, oh crap, I'm learning something different, even if it's good news. Because it approaches the justification for your entire project. Okay? So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to raise the minimum that you need to learn faster than your competition. Okay? And that's the key. Learn faster than your competition. The minimum that you need to learn faster than your competition. And it is serving this goal that what Lean Startup was created to support. Okay? That, in a nutshell, is it. Now, if you are able to, not everybody is possible, but if you are able to, if you are in a market such as a consumer software market, you should be able to do initial testing with Lean Startup methods for just the money that you have in your pocket or from small amounts of money that you can raise from family and friends. Okay? Now, a lot of people are like, no, I want to go off and raise the money. I want to go be successful. I want somebody to go tell me and validate my idea by giving me a big check. You will accomplish none of that. If you go get a big check from somebody, all that you can prove is that you can get a big check. You've demonstrated nothing about your market because you aren't talking to real customers. Only customers can tell you whether your market is successful, whether your ideas have any validity. Only your customers can take your assumptions and turn them into knowledge. Okay? So, Lean Startup is a method that's designed to help you address those issues so that you can take the minimum amount possible. Now, some people like say, oh, well, I'm in biotech or I'm in heavy iron or I'm creating a flying car. Like, how, how do I actually do that? Well, the key point is to take the minimum that allows you to learn faster than your competition. That doesn't mean <laughs> that there's some absolute minimum amount. It just means take enough so that you can stay below the radar, figure out the assumptions, demonstrate the knowledge that you've learned from those assumptions, and then not only are you going to be in a safer position just for yourself, for your own sanity, that you're pursuing an idea that's worthwhile, but you also get a higher valuation. And you'll get a higher valuation because you're taking all this risk off the table. Okay? All this risk that was associated with whether or not the idea is a good idea or a bad idea, you just take it away. Right? Because you've proved it. So that gives you a higher valuation because more of that money accrues to you as the entrepreneur and the founder and less to the investor because the investor is taking less risk. Okay? So, this has been a lot to take in. And I know it's a dry topic and I know that we all just had lunch so our bellies are full and we're all kind of, whoa. <clears throat> get snacks back there. Where's the coffee? I get it. I get it. But I want to know now if we have any questions. And I guess I have, uh, I have a microphone here, but... I'll repeat your question. I'll be able to hear you. I'd like to know if anybody has any questions associated with anything we've talked about. Any questions about the horizon model? Any place where somebody says, wait a minute, I don't get this. This doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think you're wrong on that. Any questions on this so far? Yes, go ahead. So we are going to get into a little bit of the tactics about what, okay, if I'm not giving them that answer, what answer am I giving them? So that is the next part of the presentation. But, um, but what I will push back a little bit on is that, and look, I, I know how hard this is. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, we have the entire world allayed against us, right? That caricature of the guy in the suspenders from office space is real, right? I mean, it's based on a real, a real person who really comes in and says, yeah, no, I don't like your idea, all right? But fundamentally, we're trying to shift it from a question of when are you going to break even to look at this progress that I'm showing you right now. Look at these individual customer interviews where I'm presenting this to a customer and the customer is coming out delighted with this product. No large company, and sometimes not even a VC, will be excited by that. Why? Because it's only one customer, right? But if you can show one and then two and then four and then eight and then eventually you're demonstrating a pattern, we'll get into how that pattern builds itself over time. Then you can show them nobody's making a conjecture about who out there is the divine priest that's going to be able to cut through the, the, the innovation entrails and tell me which way who's going to be successful, right? Now, 
you're fighting against a lot of VC mentality, right? I mean, the VC give themselves an annual award, right, for who performed the best. What do they call it? The Midas Award, right? Such hubris, right? But touch it and make it gold, oh, right? And those brilliant people are the ones who are able to figure out that answer in advance. But if you actually look at their performance, right, it just looks like what, what's called a random walk down Wall Street. Like the results can be equally due to chance than due to divine priests who can somehow see the future, right? So it's a very long way of saying the question they're asking is the wrong question, and you have to do your best to give them a better answer. Is that hard? Yes, but I hope to arm you with some tools to accomplish that. Other questions? OK, fantastic. We're going to get into the next piece of the presentation now. OK, so the goal, how do we answer this question? The goal is product market fit. Who's heard the term product market fit in the past? Right? Ooh, I would expect more. OK, but anyway, so product market fit was a term that was popularized by Mark Andreessen, who is the founder of Netscape and uh, uh, LabCloud and, and Nang and a few others. Very, very popular uh, investor, uh, leader of uh, Andreessen Horowitz, A16. Um, and uh, he popularized this term. And so product market fit is this sort of magical place where people are pulling your product out of you, where there's so much demand you can't keep up with it, right? Um, uh, Mark Andreessen uh, was, was asked this question. He says, OK, great. If product market fit is what we're looking for, if it's that hockey stick growth, right? If everything is up and to the right and everything's off to the races, well, how do you know that you've achieved product market fit? How do I answer this question of I'm on track to product market fit? And so Mark was talking with Eric at the Lean Startup Conference a couple of years ago. And, and Eric asked him this direct question. He says, how do you know when you've achieved product market fit? And Mark had a really great answer. It was, well, it's obvious, which is great if you're already Mark Andreessen and you created Netscape. But for me as an entrepreneur, it's obvious is not very helpful. Can you give me something more, right? And it, he couldn't give more at the time. And this is the reason why, right? We are all seeking the hockey stick of growth. We're all seeking the hockey stick of growth. We all want this magical place where we achieve product market fit and everything is up and to the right. There's just one problem with the flat part of the hockey stick. This is how we envision the flat part of the hockey stick, right? That's what it is in our mind. That's what it is in our MPV analysis. That's it in our funding pitch. That's what we've been told. Everybody's overnight success. That's what we expect it to be. What does it actually turn out to be? Well, a hell of a lot more like this, right? And by the way, it gets worse, because when you're on it, it looks like this. And there's absolutely no end to it, right? Because of course, we can't see the future. The hockey stick is only obvious in hindsight. As I like to put it, flat hockey stick is flat, right? Great, so what does that mean? Well, for all my talk about taking the minimum investment, at some point, you have to pull the trigger. At some point, you do have to go and get the funding, make your idea reality at scale, and ride the hockey stick. You cannot ride the hockey stick on the change in your pocket, right? So that means that at some point, you've got to get a bunch of money. And that produces what I call a Goldilocks problem, right? Because if you've got this adoption rate, right, this curve, is this is the curve that we're all looking for, this is the curve we're all shooting for, and that's time, and here's this bucket of money. Well, I'm going to get this bucket of money, and I've got to spend it sometime. But if I spend it too soon, oops, sorry, you're out of money, flamed out. You're a VisiCalc in a world of Excel. I heard a lot, a couple people understood that one. That's good. We get some old timers here. That's right. Right? You flame out your uh, United Computer Exchange in a world of eBay, right? Uh, Friendster is a little bit different, but you're Friendster in a world of Facebook, OK? So then you're like, OK, great. Well, then I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait until I see the hockey stick. After I see the hockey stick, then I'll go raise my money. Oh, oh sorry, too late. You're at the starting line, and everybody else has already finished the race, right? So in reality, when you have this, this, only, this amount of money only represents a certain amount of time. You have to hit this time window right. And so there's a very narrow place. And I'm talking months, not years, <laughs> months, is you have to get it right. 
Too soon, flame out. Too late, you lose. And this is the challenge. So how do I know? Thank you, but with all due respect, Mark, it's obvious it doesn't help me. And what makes this particularly difficult? Well, it's because these nice, smooth hockey sticks only exist in my spreadsheet. What does the real world look like? This. <laughs> I have two adoption numbers. And all oh, things are going great. Oh, boy. Oh, but that was just a bad month. Oh, God, I don't know. Ah, things are off to the races again, right? And now you have to make a decision. Do I go raise the money knowing that if I'm too soon, I'm done? Or do I wait, knowing that if I'm too late, somebody else steals all my fame and glory? And this is what I have to go on? How do I know this isn't just another false start? As opposed to, I actually hit it. It's paralyzing, terrifying. You're all probably here right now, <laughs> right? And this is the data that you're looking at. What we need is we need a product market fit metric. We need a way to be able to understand whether or not we are actually on the path and just on the inflection of that hockey stick or whether or not it's another false start. So how do we do that? Okay, fair warning. There be math ahead. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go through a little analysis to wind up with what we're going to call a product market fit metric. In order to accomplish this, we're going to use something that's called a Bass Diffusion Model. Now, a Bass Diffusion Model is a concept that was written by Frank Bass in the early 50s, and it has since become one of the most recognized and well-known models of most important marketing concepts of the past century. And what it does is it's designed to model technology adoptions as they come into a new environment. Right? So we have some new product innovation we want to track and measure how successful that is as it goes through this new environment. Right? And so the way that Frank does that is that, well, he doesn't do it anymore because he died a long time ago, but the way that he did that is to set up this equation. And the equation basically takes these two factors. One factor is the external effect. The external effect is when people find out about it. Right? We would call this traditional marketing, which I shorthand promotional as prom. Okay? So promotional marketing. All the outbound things where people find out about the product from some external outside source, okay? As opposed to Q, the internal effect, which I shorthand as WOM, standing for word of mouth. That's adoption as a result of an existing user's usage of the product. Now, I want to be specific here because Frank was not modeling Facebook or virality. This is related to virality in the sense that new adoptions are driven by existing users. But word of mouth doesn't have to come from a friend invite. Word of mouth can simply be, I'm looking at everybody using this really cool pointer, and I want to find out what that pointer is so that I can go buy one for myself. Okay? That's an example of word of mouth. I didn't tell you about this pointer until just now, but that's an example of word of mouth and usage, right? Or white earbuds for the Apple iPod 10 years ago, right? I want to know what that is so I can ask about it and find out about it. Conspicuous usage, okay? And so when you take that, this has been used to model microwaves, cell phone introductions, the internet, color televisions to remarkable degrees of accuracy, okay? And this is just an example, sample Frank baseline curve, right? I just made this up, it's completely fabricated, I'm only using it for illustrative purposes. But what we're saying here is that if we apply to the Frank Bass formula, the Bass diffusion curve formula, what we're saying is over this period of years, we're gonna reach new market adoption, or we're gonna have this period of flatness, then we're gonna have the hockey stick of growth, we're eventually going to start to tap out, and we're going to reach a market inflection halfway point where the baseline is 4.6 years. That's right here in the middle of the curve, right? Right there in the middle of the curve, 4.6 years, okay? And we're just setting that as a standard baseline curve, standard logistic S curve, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take our word of mouth for this product, and we're gonna hold it constant. We're not gonna do anything to it, we're just gonna keep word of mouth the same, but our promotional activities are prom, we're gonna make 50% better and 50% worse, okay? And when you can do that, I'm not sure you can see the colors, but this one on the left is the green line, the blue line is the original baseline, and then the red line to the right. So the curve to the left, we've improved our 
adoption taking our inflected point from 4.6 years to 4.1. So we moved it up about six months. Not bad, right? If we improve our marketing, we expect we would get more usage. That makes perfect sense. And similarly, if we make our usage uh, marketing crappier, then we see we push it out by about another nine months or so to 5.3 years, right? So we can see the differences in those curves. Better marketing gives you better results. Worse marketing gives you worse results, right? Now, we're going to keep the baseline the same, and we're going to change the word of mouth by the same 50% plus or minus. At the same time, we're leaving the promotional constant. Okay, so prom is constant now. WOM is what's changing. And these are the curves that we get. And you see a dramatic difference between the two of them. In the middle curve, 4.6 baseline, we get it better. We move to 3.3 years, a fairly dramatic improvement. Worse, we almost double it to 7.7 .7 years, right? And so you can see the differences these, between these curves, and it stands to reason, right? And if you're doing better marketing, Yes, you're a better marketer, but they still approach linearly. Whereas if you get more users, more users attract more users, that creates more users, and so you get a nonlinear response, right? So for those of you who are seeking this, we're doing a shift on the time access for promotional activities, and WOM has a nonlinear response. Or in English, PROM shifts the curve in time while WOM bends the curve itself. And in even better English, prom doesn't fix crappy growth. It just makes crappy come sooner. Okay? Your WOM is what defines your growth curve. It's the only source of nonlinear growth. It can't come from anywhere else. Even getting on the cover of Time Magazine or 60 Minutes Profile or the New York Times is only going to happen once. Fundamentally linear response. OK? Yes? Yes, it absolutely does. And it, it, it affects it in the sense that you can get more people to generate more intention. And that's why this curve, you'll see, you're getting more people, and your WOM is constant, so you're still getting more usage. But fundamentally, the response is, non -lin is, is a linear response. As opposed to getting more WOM, if you attract more people and more people now start to attract more people, you get a nonlinear response. So by increasing the WOM is what bends the shape of the curve itself. Now, you want more people to know about it. But let's assume for the moment that you had a zero response, like nobody was interested at all. What degree of marketing would you need to do to get everybody to adopt? I mean, infinite, right? I mean, you'd have to reach every single person everywhere multiple times. What is it, seven times? Right? And so economically, that doesn't make sense to anybody. Right? So, but, but more fundamentally, nonlinear growth curves can only come from one source. That's people referring other people. And that's just math. Right? So you even look at examples. And this is true just not only of consumer products, but, but, uh, but uh, industrial products, everything like people ask each other when they're looking for purchasing decisions. You have a big combine that you're in harvesting in agriculture. You're going to go to the John Deere conference and ask people if they like their X42A, right? And if people say, yeah, I love the X42A. It's got this great GPS feature that does X, Y, and Z. Well, you're going to take a look at that X42A. And we've all done this for any product, right? We're all asking all the time. Or it can be subtle, right? A lot of people did studies and figured out that the reason that, we'll talk about this in a second, but the reason that flat screen TVs eventually took off is that as people were driving home through their neighborhoods, they saw empty flat screen TV boxes on the side. Oh, I think I'm going to go buy one of those. Yes? We're going to get into that. You're good. You're good. You just run step ahead of the curve. Great. Okay. But I really want this to be, I want this pe people to know this because a lot of people think that all I have to do is go get the effective marketing campaign and I'm going to win the day, right? And if that were true, we'd all be wearing Google Glass, right? Right? We'd all be using Google Wave, right? Google Plus, <laughs> Google Buzz. <coughs> God, I got a Google in my throat. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? So here we have two curves. And this gets to your question and everybody's question in here. It gets back to the false start question. One of these curves is going to be a great success. 
one of these curves is not going to make it. You're one year into the project. Which do you choose? Which do you choose? Come on, give me a choice. Which do you choose? Who is the priest? With? Why? Why do you choose that one? Because you're just almighty VC. Oh, you know all, see all. Let me guess, you're either right, Gartner Report? No. Let me guess, blockchain. No. Oh. All right, well, I got nothing else. Right? The point here is that nobody really knows at this stage, right? We don't have enough information. The way the VCs actually come to their conclusion is they go and they ask other VCs, hey, did you hear about this product? That's how I raised money for my last company, right? I deliberately made all of my VC meetings within the same two-week period, right? The total of 18 meetings within two weeks. It was brutal. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to have VCA talk to VCB and say, hey, I heard about this guy. What do you, you know, I want to know if you review their pitch. And I wanted the other one to say, oh, yeah, I saw him last week. Oh, jeez, I better move fast on this one, right? That's the type of mentality that you're trying to choose. And that's how most of these decisions are made. If you're in a corporate context, you have two pitches. They both go up to finance. Which one does finance choose? I don't know, probably the one that has blockchain in it. <laughs> Why? Because I read about it in Forbes. Like they have no other information, right? And until Lean Startup takes off, the person who's going to make the decision is the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. No facts. No facts, just a hippo, right? And that's why you have politics, because in the absence of information, all decisions defer to politics. So I'm going to go play golf with the hippo, and I'm going to get my funding. Anyone else done this? Anyone else had a friend at another company? OK, great, enough of that. Great. But there is a way to know if you know what to look for. Let's remember that Bass curve. Remember WOM, remember PROM. Now, let's take a closer look at our usage data. But as opposed to looking at the aggregate data, let's do a little bit of a cross-tabulation. The curve on the left, we take the internal effect, right, the WOM, and the external effect, the PROM, and we benchmark them against each other. We see in the curve on the left, the internal effect is slowly creeping up, but the external effect remains basically constant, whereas on the right side, well, if I'm looking at the difference of where I'm getting my users, well, I'm clearly getting them from WOM and more of them from WOM on the right case. Okay? So you actually turned out to be right. You are brilliant. Thank you very much. We invest in my company. Great. Super. You can calculate this out to what I call a WPS. WPS is your WOM, total number of users through a particular cohort that you get from word of mouth, from internal usage, over the total number of users for the period, for that cohort. Okay? You have to measure it over a consistent cohort. So you can take users by a month or through an ad campaign or whatever you have, but you say, okay, who are the total number of users for every adoption that came as a result of word of mouth? And I'm going to take that over the total number of people that came from both word of mouth and promotional activities. Okay? And when you actually run those numbers and apply them to the curve, this is what you get. Curve on the right, 0.54. Curve on the left, 0.12. And yes, sir, you are correct. The one on the right is the one that's successful. The one on the left doesn't reach product market fit until 14 years. Basically, you've run out of money. You're done. Okay? So WPS is this measure of product market fit. It gives you the point of reference you need when there's just nothing else out there. You need that point of reference because these curves are pointless until they're all the way done. That's the Goldilocks problem. You only can understand the curve in hindsight. That's why it's obvious to Mark Andreessen, because he sees a lot of them. You don't have that luxury. Mark Andreessen can afford to miss a few here and there. You miss yours, you're done. So what is the number that you want to reach in terms of your curve? So the number you want to reach for WPS that you know, you're saying, yeah, I got so many unbelievably thoughtful people here. You want to basically try to shoot for close to and over or above the 50 threshold, right? Which means that you are receiving more people. Now, if you're close and there's churn, there's a whole bunch of things. There's a lot of jitter that's associated with that. And also keep in mind that your, and we'll get into this, but your uh, measurement instrumentation is more likely to be off uh, than, it won't be precise enough for you to care between 45 and 55%. But much more likely, you're going to be at zero, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so that's really what we're trying to do, is we're trying to say, how do we avoid zero, right? But these are the benchmarks. If you're between zero to 20, there really isn't any fit. You have to keep experimenting. You have to continue to say, okay, how am I trying to find something that other people are going to be willing to use in such a point and share with other people, right? 20 to 40, okay, I'm on the right track, right? I may not be there yet, but I'm headed in the right direction, right? And if I'm bouncing around there, then I want to be closer to the 40 than the 20. 40 to 60, well, then you've got pretty good fit, right? Then you're in a place where I would really start to look at raising money, right? And I'm talking 40 to 50, excuse me, 40 to 60, but with a significant number of people, like not just your friends and family, like real independent users, right? So that you have some good independent uh, information there. And then if you're over 60, you're imbalanced. You should go raise money like right now, right? Because you're off into the races and you need to feed that beast, right? So it's rare that people actually do that, but there are cases where you need to put more money in to grow. Yes? No, you can, I, I hope it's not the last one. <laughs> um, so for the, the word of mouth campaign, you know, was that number of people or number of like those actually have bought cash numbers? No, it's not a cash number. So the question is word of mouth versus prom. How do you calculate it? So what you need to do is you need to choose a specific cohort. I've already talked about that, right? So you need to choose a cohort. So whatever time slice you're slicing by that's the most typical cohort, just keep it consistent. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, or four, month, 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 or if you're in a really big, long-standing industry, maybe quarter, 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 right? Or if you're in a really short industry, maybe you even track it daily. But the point is, every time period, you're going to get new users in. What if I don't get any users in? Well, then you're zero, go back to the drawing board, right? But you've got bigger problems <laughs> that they're not referring. But every time you get more users in, you have to find out where they came from. Okay? And this is not necessarily just a NPS, would you refer a friend, right? Or user referral code. Like, like this is actually like talking to your users, doing customer discovery, and interviewing them and finding out exactly what drove them to become a user. Let me give you a concrete example of this. Uh, I always make it a habit to talk to my Uber drivers as a customer development exercise. And so I had this driver that I was talking to, and I said, oh, you know, you're in the Uber. He's like, yes, I've been doing it for a while. You like it? Yes, I do like it. How'd you get into it? He says, well, you know, uh, I was driving a taxi cab, and, and, uh, and then I found out, you know, about Uber, and I figured I didn't want to drive my taxi or my limousine anymore. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I figured I'd talk to Uber. Right? Now, if I just left it at that, if I didn't take it to the next step, then I'd say, oh, well, you know, we found out about it through some you know, promotional or you know, thing on the news or whatever. But I went a little bit deeper, and I said, oh, well, when did you start? And he's like, well, six months ago. And I was like, well, wow, Uber's been around a couple of years. You just, heard, just found out about them? Oh, no, I actually, I'd known about them for a while. They had come into our limo company and tried to get us promotions, and were giving us discounts, and were trying to get us to join. Right, and, and you know, and I said, well, did you join then? He's like, yeah, no. I said, why not? And he goes like, I don't know. Like he didn't, like he literally didn't know. He didn't have any idea why he, why he didn't do it. So I said, okay, well then what finally pushed you over the edge? And he says, well, I had a friend of mine that used to work at the limo company and I didn't see him for a while. And I was at a party and saw him and I asked him what he was doing. He says, oh, I, I started working for Uber. And I just changed my life. I love it now. And he's like, okay. And, that's when I decided to join Uber, right? And that is the classic example of a person that adopted as a result of word of mouth, as a result of somebody else's uses, versus all the promotional activity that Uber was doing. And they were doing a lot. We're going to get more into the psychology of that so that you can understand why and help tweak that out and understand that better, right? But you need to really interview your users. And look, it takes time. It takes effort. It's customer discovery. It's what makes lean startup a pain in the butt. Right? But it's critical if you're going to be successful at understanding what's driven those users. Right? And if you're facing a Goldilocks problem, it's the single best way to get the answer that you need. That's what I mean by classify the source. It's an in-depth interview process where you actually figure out and you have to, at the end of the day, decide WOM or PROM. Use your best judgment. You'll get better at it as you get more experienced. Right? But um, this is why viral products are 
very obvious, right? And I click the friends invite. That's why I joined, and that's why virality is so clear and obvious. But word of mouth can be tracked just as effectively. The last bit of advice as you're using your calculations is to make sure that you keep it smooth. You keep it smooth because you can have a lot of jitter, particularly if you do advertising campaigns. You have big advertising campaigns. You get a bunch of people that all came in as a result of the advertising campaign. Ah. Uh, your WPS is going to get really screwed up as a result of that. So you want to use things like trailing averages, moving averages, other calculation smoothing techniques so that you can create an overall smooth graph. But if you see the track and it's going up and to the right and you're heading in the right direction, then you know that you're on the right track. Okay? Now, what drives WPS? If this is the metric that we're shooting for, what drives it? Like, how, what makes somebody want to share? Well, now we're going to pull in another uh, 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 important marketing concept of the past century. And this is called the technology adoption life cycle from Everett Rogers. And what Everett Rogers found is he investigated, again, new product introductions for new innovations. It followed a very distinct pattern. And this might be a little hard to read here, but it basically followed a rough bell curve where he said 2.5% of the initial people that try are innovators. And they represent 2.5% of the overall market. And then you have early adopters at 13.5%. Then you hit the early majority. This is the bulk of the market where you start to hit the hockey stick up into the right, followed by the late majority, and then the laggards at 16%. Okay? And again, this has been shown, demonstrated time and time again that everything follows the standard, this standard curve cycle. Okay? So, some of you may be familiar with this, who's figured prominently in Crossing the Chasm, Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. Here's where the chasm is between early adopters and early majority. Okay? And the whole point about Crossing the Chasm is you do not achieve product market fit, you do not hit hyper growth if you can't get past those early adopters. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So, what Rogers found is that innovators, and I'm sorry, these are the terms that he used. I know I'm using innovation a lot. It's overloaded. But in this context, innovators are the very first tip of the spear, the first persons who are using new technology. They will try something new just because it's new. That's it. That's the only justification and reason that they need. Nothing else matters. Don't need it. Don't want it. Mark it. Doesn't matter. They're going to try something new because it's new. Okay? <laughs> These are the people that would buy Google Glass. Okay? Early adopters. Early adopters will try something new if they believe it solves a problem that they have. If they're experiencing a problem, they're like, I just have tried every solution, I can't do it. I'm, I'm going to willing to try something new because it can't be any worse than what I'm doing right now. So if they have a problem and they think that your technology is going to solve it, well, that's when early adopters will come into the market and try your product. This last piece is the critical one, critical one for your business, critical one for product market fit, critical one for your growth, critical one for your funding, critical one for your WPS. Have I emphasized enough that it's critical? The early majority will try new if and only if other people are using it. It doesn't matter how many times Uber went after that, tech, that driver. It didn't matter. The promotions, multi-million dollar ad campaigns, doesn't matter. They will only try it if other people are using it. Okay? This is another way to look at the same information. Okay? Are others using it? Yes, no. Does it solve a problem? Yes, no. Okay? And this is the way that it goes around the curve. The innovators will come. It doesn't matter if it solves a problem. Big, shiny, technological turd. Doesn't matter. It's new. I've got to try it. Right? Right? Blockchain pet. Where do I sign up? Okay? They're, 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 they're always going to come in. You get these guys for free. All you have to do is figure out about it. Okay? After that, you have the early adopters. Well, they need to see that there's a problem being solved. But they don't need to see other people using it. You still just need to reach them. They still need to hear about it. Right? Your promotional still has to be in place, but you have to be able to communicate a problem, a uh, solution to the problem that they have. Okay? Early majority, they are the ones who first need to see others using it. And oh, by the way, they have to kind of see that there's a problem here too. Right? 
So in my Uber driver example, yeah, his problem was that his taxi hated driving for the limo company, the taxi company, right? So now I see that there's a better solution and my buddy did it too, I'm in, okay? And that's when the market starts heading up to the right. Late majority in laggards, they have to have other people using it and it doesn't matter whether it solves a problem because everybody's already using it. This is your mom and Facebook, right? They did Facebook because everybody was on Facebook, right? Now all the kids are off and the moms are still on, right? No longer solves the problem, but that's it, right? Everybody's got to use it, okay? What's another way to look at this in the product life cycle? Ah, that's our innovate phase. Ah, that's our growth phase. Ah, that's our profit phase, okay? Hopefully I don't can do that without having to tie back to the original visual, okay? So this is now what we're trying to achieve. This is now what we're trying to do. And how are we doing it? We're using Lean Startup. How many people here through the course of Lean Startup? Actually, I had a big assumption. How many people here have heard of Lean Startup at all? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Lean Startup, a way to use market iteration, rapid market iteration and market learning to get results. One big concept in Lean Startup is called minimum viable product. Who here is sort of MVP, minimum viable product? Right. Minimum viable product is building the smallest, least viable thing that you can in order to accomplish your mission of demonstrating that the product is going to be successful in the marketplace. Getting evidence and taking your assumptions and turning them into knowledge. How do you take your assumptions and turn them into knowledge? You put an MVP out in the world and observe the actual results. Okay, everyone with me on that so far? Now, MVPs, and you don't need to worry about all this hugely, but there's a little bit of controversy within Lean Startup about, well, what exactly is an MVP? Now, most of that is inside baseball crap you don't need to concern yourself with, right? But I do have a solution where we say, okay, um, if I'm doing a quick AdWords test, is that an MVP or do I actually have to build a product? Like, like what constitutes the minimum in minimum viable product? I separate it out into two concepts, two specific concepts, okay? One of them is a minimum solution product, minimum solution product, and that's something you're putting out there in the world that says that it's going to solve a problem, and then your minimum referable product, which is something that is tangible enough that you would actually refer it to a friend of yours. I'll touch upon the minimum referable product in a while. Let's talk about minimum solution product. So minimum solution product is something that you put out there in the world to probe and get the response for gauging problem solution fit. If the goal here is to be able to say that there is a problem out there and my product solves it, I want to get some evidence that that's true if that's the first step. If the first people beyond the innovators that come for free need to be able to know that there's a problem that my product solves, I've got to be able to test that, right? And you'll learn more about product problem solution fit in the next presentation with Ash Moria, who I think coined the term. Did you coin it, Ash? Maybe, maybe. Take credit for it. I won't tell. Problem solution fit. So you'll learn more about that later. Where does that fit in these graphs? Well, this is where your minimum solution product fit. It helps take you from the innovators into the early adopters, right? It helps take you from the people that are just trying something because it's new to something because they actually care. And that's the question that you're trying to answer. It should be the very first question that you answer for anything that you have. Does anybody care at all? Now I say that so simply and it seems so obvious, but when you actually go through the example of people and the amount of VC money wasted to figure out the answer to this question, which you could do so much simpler and cheaper, it will boggle your mind, right? Does anybody remember color, right? $50 million of investment to get the answer, does anyone care? No. Web van, one billion. Green box, half a billion. Like nobody cared about these products at the time that they were released into the market. It shouldn't cost us a billion dollars in venture capital to get the answer to that question. It should be question number one. Does anyone have this problem that I'm solving? Right? At the time that I'm in the market, right? Webvan was a darling 20 years ago that raised a billion dollars to sell online groceries at a time where nobody cared about online groceries. Now we do it all the time. 20 years too early, billion dollars to figure out the answer. No, the answer was no, nobody cares. Okay, so when you're developing a minimum solution product, 
here's where you can do things that are like a lot of trips and tick, uh, tips and tricks within the lean startup movement, such as false doors. We have a website, a launch site, where you're articulating a product, and a person goes in to sign up for that product. And if nobody signs up for the product, well, then you know that nobody cares, right? Or concierge testing, right? Where you have something that you're offering, and you have a person that's taking you through the process, sometimes called Wizard of Odds testing, where you're taking somebody through the process, teaching you how the product would work, where they may be just working off of a prototype or a keynote presentation, right? But to the user, it feels like a real product, right? Or it could be even as simple as AdWords testing, where you're selling something and you're saying, my brand new product, and you go buy $200 worth of AdWords. If nobody clicks on the AdWords, maybe you need to rethink your problem statement, right? Now, it could be that your product really doesn't solve a problem. It also could be that you're not articulating it in the right way. But the point is, you don't have to raise a ton of money to go get the answer to that question. You could figure it out tonight for less than $100, the first iteration of the answer to that question. And maybe the answer to the question is, oh, yeah, you've really hit on something. You have a whole list of people that you can now follow up with later. right? I'm not going to dive into this in any great detail because we're, I know that we've done some other lean startup testing here, and that's really not the focus of this presentation. The point here is that your minimum solution product is something you're putting out there in the real world to see how people actually respond to it, right? Your goal is to get people to care. Your goal is to look for validated learning, where it's not just another hypothetical. It's not some random priest that tells you it's a good idea. Or an actual user clicked. 50% of the people clicked on the ads or got through the end of concierge testing and say, I want this. Or you've got a whole bunch of people that were willing to put in their emails on your false store web page, right? You're looking for the conversion rates. You're looking for a substantial conversion rate so that people were convinced by the value proposition that you offered as part of your imaginary product, right? Now, a lot of people will then come up to me and say, Dave, I don't want to sell an imaginary product. I want to sell a real product, right? And I get that. People are going to be pissed when they find out about my imaginary product, right? Right? So yes, if you are lucky enough to have so many people sign up for your imaginary product that you are at risk of pissing them off, congratulations, first of all. I think it's a great problem to have. Second of all, go make those people happy. Right? Give them the product for free or at a discount so they can be your early evangelists. And for God's sakes, if your thing is really going off and to the right, then shut it down, go build it for real, and raise the money. Right? What's far more likely is nobody will give a crap. <laughs> Right? Like nobody will care at all about your imaginary product that is perfect because it's imaginary. That you're not even charging anything. So if you can't get people to click on a stick, one little click for no money for your imaginary product that's perfect, how on God's green earth do you think you're going to sell real money for your actual product, which won't work a tenth as well as that? Right? That's the point of the exercise. Did I see a question out there? No? Okay, great. So a lot of people get hung up on this. And again, this is the entrepreneur's mindset. I see the future. I want to go make it real as quickly as possible. Right? I'm with you. And if you're right, you'll blitz through this testing. <laughs> but if you're wrong, don't you want to know? Okay. So that's one step on innovation accounting. Want to be able to put out minimum solution products, measure conversion rates. Okay. There's a whole bunch of tactics. I'm happy to talk with you ad nauseum if you want to learn about the tips and techniques to that. Okay, But the point is, figure out the answer. Does anybody care at all? If you achieve that level, then you want to actually get to the point of using a minimum referable product. This is the second thing I said to gauge product market fit. Now, this is where it gets interesting. All the things that I talked about before could be virtual, or low cost, or faked, or concierged, right? cheap, Fast, fast, fast learning. When you actually get to this stage, and I think this is where minimum viable product starts to get a bad rap, you actually have to build something that somebody else is willing to refer. right? If I click on a fake door and don't get the product, it doesn't matter how much I cared about it, I can't refer it because I don't even have it. There can't be word of mouth from that. right? So now you want to be able to produce the minimum referable product, which is something that somebody can use and say, wow, you know, this is a little rough on the edges, but you've got to try this. It's just changed my life, right? Okay, that's the goal. That's what we're seeking for when it comes to the minimum referable product gauge, product market fit, and that's where this sits. 
taking the early adopters and testing them to make sure that they're actually willing to use it in such a way that it produces word of mouth. Okay? So I'm doing this because it's sort of cute. Does anyone care? Does anyone share? But realize that share is kind of loaded. I don't really mean share. I'm just doing that for the rhyme. Okay? This is not about Facebook or sharing or Twitter. Right? This is about conspicuous enough usage that other people see it. Right? As a sign of word of mouth. Right? So, this is how you gauge your minimum referable product. First of all, does your solution work? We'll talk about this as a concrete example, but if you proposed a solution and it doesn't work, <laughs> well, you're not going to get farther than that because who's going to refer something that it doesn't work? Do people continue to use it? Does it solve the problem enough that they're willing to change their behavior? This is another difficult one. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is that usage visible? Right? Because as we've learned throughout all kinds of experimentation, history, Rogers curve, Bass curve, it really all boils down to this. Without conspicuous usage, conspicuous usage from early adopters, the early majority will not accept. It just won't. It, just, it does not matter how good you tell somebody Google Glass is. It just doesn't matter. Right? The early majority will not adopt. Yes, build a better product. I mean, and that's not a joke. Like, that's a pithy answer, but it's actually the, the, the only answer, right? This is why early stage engineers tend to focus on product and they eschew marketing, right? Because marketing is, could potentially produce a false flag, right? You could get people really ginned up because you had a really exciting marketing campaign, right? There's a lot of people that signed up for Google Wave back in the day, right? Just nobody ever used it, right? So you have to build a product that people are willing to use and share, right? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because I'll show you some concrete products so that you can get it. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, people share your product because your product is cool, right? But it's not just that the product is cool, it's because you made the person cool. Kathy Sierra talks about this. She calls it user badass. Sorry for the language, user badass. And what she says is you're not trying to build a cool product, you're trying to make your users cool, right? Why do people share? Why do people share? Why do people tell other people about other products? Is it because they're trying to make that person successful? Not really. You share because you want to look cool. Right? Somebody sends out a really, really clever tweet. Right? You go back and you check how many people retweeted it. Right? If it was clever, why would that be important? Well, go back and look. That's how, that's how Facebook like, like relies on that dynamic in order to be successful. Right? So, um, you have to build your, design your product in such a way that you make your users so cool that they want to tell everybody else how cool they are, right? And the ultimate goal is that you want to have somebody come back to them and say, oh my God, thank you so much for telling me about that. It changed my life, right? When Uber first started out and I first started using it, I told everybody I could possibly find about Uber. Nobody knew about it yet. I wanted to be that cool guy that everybody said use it. And then yeah, everybody who did, like, called me up and like, oh my God, I'm never getting in a taxi cab again, ever. Thanks, Dave. Right? That's what you're trying to engender in people. Okay? So concrete examples, let me show you a tale of two products. Okay? Uh, hopefully this is nobody's idea in this room. All right. So this is a problem. These are both things that I experienced problems that I had. Right? I like to cook fresh bread, and my bread would get soggy, and vegetables would go bad. And so I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder if somebody has a product that creates a vacuum chamber or otherwise can keep my bread fresh for longer than... Than, than it is, right? So I searched it up and I looked this up, but it's called VacuVita, right? And so uh, you can see what it is, but basically it sits on your counter and you put your bread or your food or whatever it is, you close the top, you press the button, it sucks all the air out, and the food lasts a lot longer, right? Your bread stays fresh, right? So I'm like, okay, this is a problem that I have. I'm going to go try that product, right? Now this is another product. I like beer. Somebody cut that out of context. I like beer, right? And this is something called the UKEG uh, by a company called Growler Works. And it's hard to see in the, with the light, but basically it's a pressurized growler. So you go get some craft beer from your local brewery, you fill it up, it pressurizes it, and then you pull it. It keeps your beer fresh. 
because I was buying growlers of beer, growlers are large containers of beer, you know, the equivalent of a six pack from a, from a thing and taking it home. And the beer would go flat, so I had to drink the whole six pack that night. <laughs> problem. <laughs> problem. Maybe not. Anyway, yes, problem. I wanted to keep my beer fresh without having to drink the whole six pack, okay? And this thing articulated it would, that it would solve that problem by keeping the beer fresh, okay? Now, what was my actual experience with this? I tried both of these products because they both said that they solved a problem that I had. Classic early adopter. I have this problem. I want to go see if this solves this problem. So I bought the Vacuvita. And it kind of worked. It did evacuate all of the air out of the thing. And it kind of made some things a little bit fresher, but it was interesting because it didn't really suck out the moisture. And so everything would get soggy. So my bread wouldn't go stale, but it would get soggy and was not usable. Okay? So I said, all right. I learned that. It was really interesting. I took the Vacuvita out and I put it in my garage and I eventually sold it to somebody else and I warned them that my bread was soggy and they said, not a problem. This works really well, like a charm. I would have a beer and it wait about it for two weeks and I could have another beer and it was just as fresh as if I had just gotten it from the store, right? I would then take this by the convenient handle with the big Growler Works logo on the side and walk in to the brewery with it. What happens? Everybody asks, what's that? Right? Did I go walking through, hey, everybody, look at this cool thing. No, I just, I, just, I walked in. Every time I walk in, somebody asks, what's that? And I tell them, and I'm happy to tell them. And I tell them, I drink beer differently now. A lot less of it. <laughs> but I don't have to drink it all in one sitting, right? And I would give them all the things. Why? Because I wanted to tell them that this was a really, really cool product, right? And if they like beer, like, like I like beer, you might want to consider trying it too. And I could see people literally get on their phones and write themselves notes and in some cases order the device right then when I was there, okay? Now, this is not scientific. I don't have any insight into either one of these companies, but let's just take a look at the overall searches for them, right, using a Google Trends analysis. Green is Vacuvita. Blue is UKEG. Big press news release, big bump, lots of interest in it, right? And then down, down and to the right. UKEG, up and to the right, okay? Now, is this conclusive proof of my theory of WPS? No, clearly not, right? But my final point, point that I want you to understand is that if people would come into my house and see the Vacuvita on my counter and ask, what's that? If it solved the problem, I would tell them. I would be happy to tell them, and maybe they would buy it as a result. Nobody's going to buy one as a result of my WOM if it's sitting in my basement or I've sold it. Every time I go get beer, I get asked about the UKEG. Every time. And I tell them. Right? Now, they haven't done any other additional advertising campaign, and you can see that they're off and to the right. Okay? Conspicuous usage. Conspicuous usage, right? I knew a long time ago that Google Glass was going to be a complete disaster. And I wasn't, I was, a whole bunch of VCs were talking to me, want to get into this space, there's interesting, a lot of money behind it. And I said, I don't know, and I wasn't sure, right? And then I went to a coffee shop in San Francisco, and this was very early on, and I somebody, saw somebody wearing them. And I'm like, oh my God, that guy looks like a complete idiot. No way in hell am I going to wear that. No way in hell anybody else is going to wear that, right? I like to poke fun at them, but remember those brilliant guys that I talked about, including Mark Andreessen, right? You just don't look good wearing these things, right? That's why I know it was not going to be successful. That's why I made a prediction three years ago, and I still think I'm going to hold to this prediction, that virtual reality is not going to be successful in its current incarnation. Because you don't want to be this guy, right? It cuts you off from humanity. There's no warm with this. Okay? And there certainly is no WOM with this. Okay? So my point is the first thing you have to do is you do have to solve a problem. If you don't solve a problem, people churn out. If they're not using it, they can't refer other users. Your WOM flattens out. But even if you potentially solve a problem, like the fact that it's hard to get through an airport, you're not going to catch me dead riding my luggage. <laughs> now, I could be wrong. These guys could be off and to the right, right? But I'm making predictions because I like to make predictions to show you that I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. 
So to improve your WPS, we're in the home stretch here. To improve your WPS, the first and most critical thing is you actually have to solve the problem. If you don't solve the problem, people don't use. If people don't use, they can't refer. That comes to the product. No amount of marketing will convince people to use a product that doesn't solve a problem that they have. Okay? The chasm comes in because you get people to think that you can solve their problem. A whole bunch of people come in, you market it, you don't actually solve their problem, you never cross over into the early majority because the early adopters stop using it. Okay? So you have to solve the problem first and foremost. Secondly, we talked about this, how can you make it better? Design WOM into your product. Be really, really conscious. Not about developing a list of features, and not even necessarily about how do I make my user great, but how do I design this product in such a way that other people are going to ask about it at a dinner party, or when they're walking through the brewery, or when they're coming over to the house. You can design that into the product. Think about that connection. Think about the WOM as you're designing the product. It's so what's going to drive the nonlinear growth. And maybe it's just that the product is just so fantastic, like people are going to use it. That's good enough, right? But take advantage of it as much as you can. The last little tiny piece of advice to help improve your WPS is to start not in the biggest markets, but to start in the most connected markets. Start in markets where people really have a real close connection and they talk with each other a lot. Start in places where the WOM is easier traveling than in other markets. Now, sometimes in your product, that's not possible, right? Or your product has a particular market and that's it, you're set, right? But if you had an opportunity to market to, um, you know, uh, to, uh, to market to uh, new moms, market to new moms that all get together and talk and share baby pictures all the time, right? The point is that you don't want to have necessarily the biggest market. You want to have the most connected market because connected helps support your WOM. WOM will get you to that hyper growth faster. Okay? Jeffrey Moore called this be a big fish in a small pond. And sometimes it's just about making the pond small, right? Because if the pond is sufficiently small, everyone talks to each other. That's the definition of a market. A group of people with similar needs, looking to solve similar problems that refer each other when making product decisions. Right? So that's how you start in connected markets. OK? So we made it to the end. Thank you. This is the summary. First of all, understand the three accounting horizons. OK? You have to know what phase you're in of the product life cycle. If you gauge your innovation by profit, you're going to fail. If you gauge your profit by growth, you're going to fail. If you gauge your growth by innovation metrics, you're going to fail. Because you are how you are measured you have to align your measurement and corporate governance scheme to the goal that you're trying to accomplish, okay? So know whether or not you're in the product phase, growth phase, or innovation phase. For innovation, if you are within that, the focus is on learning, taking our assumptions and writing up the growth curve to turn them into knowledge, taking our profit assumptions, write them up to knowledge, okay? So the focus is on learning, turning our assumptions into knowledge. Learning implies that you don't know the answer in advance. You're going to hit a lot of conflicts with that, particularly people that are in a profit phase of mind because they got to profitability because they have to know the answer in advance because you don't produce a billion widgets unless you know the answer or else you lose your job. Okay? So realize that you're always going to come against that. And finally, you also you need to use a minimum solution product to make sure that you're in the right ballpark, but that should be quick and easy Ultimately, you cross over the chasm by getting your WPS over 50. So focus on your WOM prom score, your WPS score, as a metric for how successful you're being to get yourself to that nirvana so we can all be successful. Okay? I look forward to seeing everybody's presentations tomorrow as a judge. I believe we may have some time for some ending questions. Anybody? Last minute questions? Yes. See, I told you it wouldn't be the last one. Good for you. Yeah, you never. How do you stay ahead of the curve? Because sometimes it's easy to get to that phase if you don't have the right inventory or all these other things, and you might miss the execution. You might miss your execution point, but before you get to execution point, you have to know that you're executing something worthwhile. 
Like this is the standard fear for people that come from that profit mindset. Like I have to make my execution targets. I have to make my quarter numbers, right? I may leave some money on the table, right? But what's more likely when you're building a startup and a new product in a new market? Is it more likely that you're going to miss your targets because you weren't able to get your production scheme settled? Or is it more likely that nobody cares about your product, right? When Webvan built a billion dollars of infrastructure, they could deliver groceries anywhere in the country. They built that to nine, uh, four, excuse me, three nines tolerance. So they were going to be able to handle any limit of demand, and they built it all in advance. They got none. None. Right? I know a client of mine that did an incredible launch to sell their product in, in India. Fast market. They, unbelievable effort they put into it, developed it for two years, right? Uh, did an advertising campaign that was in the tens of millions of dollars. Right? And they expected to get close to half a million signups within their first month. They got 18. 18. Like, and those probably were executives, right? I mean, it's like it was insane how bad it was. Right? So, um, and uh, there are examples where you have a scenario where your, your demand is overwhelming and you're not able to keep up with it and your system breaks. That happens, right? It's actually rare, very rare that it's fatal, right? And anyone here who remembers the early days of Twitter, Twitter was failing all the time, multiple times a day, right? Fail whale. Anyone remember the fail whale? Like they literally had a icon that would come up when it would fail. It failed so often. It became a meme in its own, right? Still went up and to the right. You want, you want, so there's this question, this gets to another concept in Lean Startup, but I'll touch upon it briefly. There's the concept of market risk versus technical risk, okay? So market risk, does anybody care? Technical risk, can it be built, right? Every product, new product, has a mix of technical risk and market risk. Let me give you an ultimate example of high technical risk and low market risk. Teleportation. Theme me up, Scotty, right? If you can create teleporter, I would take it. I would pay for it, right? Because it took me a long time to get here on a flight. I'd much rather go around the corner and just be beamed back home and be with my kids, right? And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. So we know, we know that people are willing to be transported. It's just that teleportation is a really hard problem, right? It's not solved yet. Curing cancer, hard problem. People are going to pay if you can cure their cancer, right? Low market risk. Let me give you an example of low technical risk, high market risk. Um, Airbnb for cats, right? I want to share my cat with somebody else on the internet, right? I could create a cat sharing website by this evening. Would anybody care? Would they pay me money for my cat sharing website, right? I don't know, probably not, right? But the point is there's a lot of market risk. We have to figure out the answer to that market risk first, right? So that's, that's the whole point. Like when somebody develops a new, and it's the same concept, right? The same concept at Lean Startup. When somebody develops a new car, do they go and build a million of them for the first time? No, they go build prototypes. They test them on the road, right? They go see how they work before they release them everywhere. Lean Startup, same thing. We want to test our market hypothesis and remove our market risk first, right? So what I'm suggesting to you is what you articulated, I can't keep up with my orders, is fundamentally a technical risk problem, right? The bigger problem that you probably face is market risk. Can I get those millions of orders? And let me tell you, you want to get to a point where you're going to a VC and you're saying, I have millions of orders I cannot fulfill. Yeah, you will leave there. They, will, they won't let you leave without putting a check in your pocket, right? Because they want those very scarce, highly coveted, expensive cost of capital resources applied to technical risk. Because if I go throw money at engineers and have a hard problem and say, solve that problem, <laughs> they're going to solve that problem, right? The problem the engineers can't solve is go find me more customers. No, engineer is not good at that problem, right? Other questions? Yes? Uh, thank you so much for it. Uh, it was a great presentation. <laughs> Just one uh, moron's opinion. <laughs> Doesn't make me right, but thank you. <laughs> Oh, good gracious. Got another hour and a half? <laughs> it's not to make money, I'll tell you that for sure. 
right? If you want to make money with a higher reliability and lower risk, go be an investment banker. And I'm not kidding. You'll make a ton more money and it'll be much less risk. You have to have a vision that's going to change the world. And you have to feel that you would just be just killing yourself if you left this planet without making that vision a reality. It's the only thing that drives an entrepreneur, right? So an entrepreneur is a, Steve Blank, who's the founder of Lean Startup, calls it a calling. Like, I think it's actually an affliction, right? I would have made a lot more money if I hadn't gotten into another thing. I just, I had no choice. I was born to be an entrepreneur. I've got things I've got to make real in the world. I just got to make the world a better place. It seems trite, but I think that that's true. So if that's not driving you, if you are looking at it to become the next, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and be on the cover of Time, I don't think that's the... I mean, far be it for me to make a judgment, but I don't think that's the right motivation. And I think it's going to get you into trouble when things get tough. Like, you have to have that vision that nobody else can see. Because at the end of the day, that's the, it's the only constant in your world. Everything else is going to be changing. So if you don't have a constant uh, thing to hold on to, your vision, it's going to, uh, it's going to all fall apart. Now, look, Lean Startup exists because it's so easy for that reality distortion field to actually affect your own mind. Right? And this is how these billion dollar disasters start because somebody got really brilliant that we're all going to want to wear computers on our faces, right? Or have groceries delivered in 1998, more right around on segways, right? Um, so, you know, we call the winners geniuses because they figured it out at the end, right? And we call the other people, well, no, they just didn't get it. But that's just survivor bias. We only focus on the people that were being successful, we don't consider all the people that weren't. Why? Because they didn't make it, <laughs> right? So um, Lean Startup exists as a methodology. These innovation accounting exists as methodologies to help give you real evidence so that you can take those assumptions and turn them into knowledge. Because look, the only thing worse than not having your vision become a reality is working on your vision for 20 years and never having it become a reality. You could have done something else, another idea started a family, had kids, right? Done another job, right? And that ultimately is the worst phase, fate. Failing is not the worst fate, right? The worst fate is either having regrets for never tried or pushing through it to the point where you've given up your life when you could have done something else. So, any other questions? All right, see you tomorrow, thank you very much.